The theme of the next panel discussion is supply chain management as a catalyst in FM outsourcing. Uh, moderating this wonderful discussion, we have with us Mr. S. Narayan, who uh, is in fact is a veteran in the real estate industry, having started and nurtured the business in the Mahindra Group besides establishing Lavasa as its president. He's also been an advisor to the developers and realty funds and continues to play a role in the industry. Mr. Narayan is also the founder and president of Integron. So uh, looks like we're just taking a couple of minutes to set the stage. But meanwhile, I'd like to go ahead and also introduce our uh, next set of panel members as well. Uh, firstly, I'd like to invite on stage our session moderator, Mr. S. Narayan. Could we have a huge round of applause to welcome him on the stage? Our next panelist is Mr. Aval Sethi, Head of Supply Chain Management and Procurement, Integrated Facility Management at Jones Long LaSalle. And he comes with more than 22 years of experience. And uh, let's have a round of applause to welcome Mr. Aval Sethi. Moving on to our next panel member, Mr. Vikas Rawat, Vice President Operations at Nerlon Limited with over 24 years of cross-functional experience in project management, general administration, facilities management, and HR management across the industry verticals, including 12 years of experience in the Indian Army. Our next panel member is Mr. Rudiger Schroeder, the Managing Director at Karcher Cleaning Systems Private Limited. He's also an international sales uh, background. Uh, he comes with international sales background and has lived and worked in Europe, USA, and India, and also traveled throughout Asia extensively. Our final panelist for the session is Mr. Naveen Upadhyay, National Manager of Procurement and Capacity Management at Kotak Mahindra Bank Limited, and comes with over 12 years of experience in the field of facilities management, project, and procurement. May I also invite Mr. Naveen Upadhyay on the stage? Let's have a warm round of applause to welcome all our panel members, uh, all our speakers here on the stage. I'd like to hand over the proceedings to Mr. S. Narayan. Over to you, sir. Good morning, friends. I got to thank Sajid because he was very kind. He, he initially started out by saying people with gray hair are digital migrants and didn't know technology. Mercifully, he left the bald people out. <laughs> we had a very interesting uh, discussions on technology and the importance of technology. I'm going to take the, and it kind of revolved around workplace management. Yes, it's important. Workplaces is, is where we spend a lot of our time, but the challenges with the facility management, the integrated facility management function and the companies, both from a uh, service provider perspective and from a client perspective, goes far beyond the workplace. Today, facility management companies are expected to not just maintain office spaces. It's gone beyond into property management, into township management, and de facto, the large integrated facility management providers have become municipal service providers and, and beyond. So the challenges of providing and, and acquiring those services goes beyond a single building, however complex it may be, into multiple functions across multiple locations, across very varied kind of services. In that kind of a situation, procuring or even planning for that service is an extremely complex issue. May not be complicated, but is definitely is extremely complex. In that context, I have a very interesting panel. I have gentlemen who, who, uh, who are running large office complexes. We have people who are from the client said have been involved in managing townships and developing townships and we have a gentleman who's providing services across all the spectrum that I've talked about. So let, what I'm going to do is in the interest of time, I'm going to let each of the panelists talk for five minutes and I will trigger the topic and then get into a panel discussion and I'll still hopefully leave about 10-15 minutes for question and answer session. Don't want to keep you away from lunch for too long. Let me start with Mr. Rawat. So Rawat, you have, with an army background, you would have seen how efficiently the cantonments are being run. Then you moved on to the commercial space of running large spaces, and now you are in a space where you are literally developing a township and maintaining it. How difficult or how have the procurement 
process evolved as you have moved through these spaces. Uh, thank you. Just to begin, uh, rather than coming to the point, um, I would, would like to elaborate a bit in the sense that when we are developing any building, any campus, township, we first put customer in the center. So what is his need? What is the best way it can be served? And that's how the designers, the project managers, the procurement uh, leads, everyone focused towards that side. So with this, uh, I'm coming now to procurement proper. In case of procurement, we are looking at, are we getting at the right material at the right cost? That's one, that's at the time of project stage. But subsequent stage, when we are maintaining it, we want a surety of supply. It shouldn't happen that I have used a particular material today, but when there's a time for replace a uh, broken tile or a broken uh, stone, that's when I find that tile or that shade is out of market. Then I'll be absolutely tied down. So we want the assurance of that supply. And secondly, the guarantee of the price. If I have taken a product after five years, if the cost of replacement is too high, then my maintenance budget is going to shoot up, which is going to impact overall my customers. So that's where, for us, procurement has to be a very, very deeply embedded uh, stream, which need to assure not only the, at the time of project, but in the lifespan of property as well. So, given the spread and the width and depth of the procurement processes you, you have, you are compelled to do, do you think that, you know, you want to deal with, say, somebody like a JLL whom we represent and put it all on a single source basis or you think that it's better for the clients to keep multiple sources and control procurement from efficient service providers and suppliers across various verticals? Uh, in this, what we are comfortable with and what we have seen it's working well for us is where we keep entire procurement with us. That's where we have economy of scale. We can tweak a lot of requirements. We can deal directly with OEMs. And that's when, when we give a large bulk, bulk order, that's when we gain those advantages. If the same is given to various occupants or various licensees, probably their requirement, their, uh, their need of a change may vary. And that may, uh, that may somehow uh, will not be able to take out that advantage of a large township. So how do you ensure efficiencies in that? Because everybody can't be inefficient in everything that you expect him to do. So effectively, he becomes a consolidator for you. So how do you evaluate which consolidator to go to for providing these services? Uh, in this scenario, we typically look at who is the person who is giving us the best rate right in the beginning. So not only at the time of CapEx, we, if someone, suppose we are taking a HVAC, HVAC equipment, and that's when we compare if the useful life of that equipment is, say, of 10 years. We look at what is the cost of initial purchase and thereafter subsequent maintenance for those 10 years. So we look at who's giving us the best rate at that point of time. We freeze at that point of time itself. So it is anyone who's quoting us the best rate, who's giving us a surety, and we have that comfort factor that, yes, he's not undercutting just to get the order. He will be able to deliver. He has that uh, market reputation, reputation. With that, then we are comfortable to go with that particular source. Let me jump to Mr. Sethi. You, you are on the other side of the spectrum. You have a huge challenge on procuring services from vendors and sub-vendors, and also meeting the client's requirement against, uh, across various functions that the client expects you to do knowing JLL where you involve from not just maintaining buildings, but the infrastructure and the traffic solutions and you name it, you guys are putting in systems and you've been delivering efficiently. Can you please share with us what is the challenges in convincing a client that you have the ability to deliver across a spectrum of services? And how do you ensure that is effectively met by your vendors and suppliers? And where do you see this going over the next five years? Okay. So firstly, when we talk of uh, processes in supply chain, 
uh, what immediately comes to mind is a very fine map of the process with a very well-defined workflow. But as we move from companies to companies, there are a lot of variations. And the question is not whether there can be efficiency built into a process, but whether the traditional processes are relevant itself. Um, and if we look at the world around, let me put it um, as a different perspective is, today there are very different drivers that are driving supply chain. There is a lot of IT-led supply chain that is happening. There's a lot of emphasis on sustainability, on uh, compliances, uh, requirements being asked of uh, risk to be managed within the supply chain. But also if you look at the entire landscape of supply chain, the entire landscape is changing. First and foremost, the context itself is changing today. So there are a lot of disruptive forces within supply chain and how are we dealing with them? How are companies actually looking at some of the risk and the opportunities and then cashing on those? Um, Apart from that, uh, the technology itself is playing a big role in the way that we are delivering to our clients. A lot of companies are imbibing technology in their delivery modules. And uh, when we look across, uh, companies are taking on board various technology platforms, from the Aribas to the Hyperos to extensive. But are all these systems integrating together to create a very, very efficient delivery model for the clients? As we move, as service providers within GLL, as we move from client to client, every client has, seems to have a different kind of an expectation, a different kind of a benchmark, and that becomes very challenging today. The other piece related to it is the culture itself. And so 2015, we've seen a lot of acquisitions that have happened in the market. These acquisitions bring in a lot of differences in the culture of the employees, um, the clients, and the supplier base altogether. How do these integrate, and how long will it take to integrate these factors? Uh, companies are becoming more transnational, and therefore, people want consistent approaches and delivery modules. Somebody working in an Australia market would want the same type of delivery in an Indian market. That's becoming a challenge. But if you look at the evolution of the supply chain, we're moving into more smart and connected, more use of technology, RFIDs, um, but what we will also see very soon is a smart FM emerging. And the smart FM is going to have wearable technology within. And that te wearable technology, while the FM is interacting with the client, will also be passing information back into real time to the supply chain network and the supplier networks. And by the time he finishes his conversation, he will already have solutions ready to offer to the clients. Uh, so these are the things that are changing, but what is also driving, therefore, is the skill set of a supply chain professional uh, to be able to deliver. So today, we're looking at people who are more tech savvy, people who will probably have higher project management skills, because they are the people who will need to take the initiative to identify after discussion with the client, uh, to plan, and then roll out these initiatives to the client satisfaction. Let me go to Naveen. Navin, you, you know, taking on, I'll come back to you, Aval, you know, going on to Navin. You have your own challenges of uh, getting the right service providers across different locations because your challenges is unique, right, from a single ATM machine which needs to be maintained and guarded to large complex office spaces. In your procurement system, how do you define, if I can use that word, the quality of a service provided, how, you, how do you evaluate him and how do you compare him with the, the peers in the industry or outside? Right. To start with, I'll say that first thing uh, I'll say FM has moved a lot from the time it started. When it started, it was simply considered as a department which takes care of uh, repair and maintenance, more of a department which is into logistics and coordination. And from there, we have come to a point wherein it's a very specialized function. And a lot of credit for this goes to FM service provider. They have specialized this function. Now, within FM, everything is specialized, be it space management, be it procurement, be it uh, the mechanical part of it. So when you plan to outsource such a function which is of critical importance to an organization, you consider a lot of things. You have a lot of questions. You have a lot of apprehensions in case I outsource this function. To start with, I'll say that first question is, 
whether outsourcing a function dilute the sense of ownership which is there as of now with my in-house resource? Will it give me the results which is being projected by the service provider? So all those apprehensions are there. Once you are convinced to an extent wherein you think, yes, it can be achieved, thereafter you move to a step wherein you think of scoping as to how would you start. Would you outsource this in one straight go, everything outsourced? Or would you like to do in bits and pieces? Or you would bifurcate this into two. Let's say one is experiential part of it. I'll work on, I'll maybe outsource housekeeping, security, reception part of it, cafeteria. And maybe the core function, which is utilities and services, that will be in-house. I'm not comfortable to start with. Now, when you have done this scoping, then you think about, OK, apart from the way I'm managing my function today, what is it my FM service provider, which I'm looking at, will provide in terms of, let's say, audits, in terms of technology platforms, which they can provide? And then you start thinking about who would be a right partner for this. Do I work it out with a regional partner? Do I work it out with a national player? How do I do it? Who will be the right person? And that's where you start with the vendor pre-qualification process. You take details from all the agencies who are there. Thereafter, you conduct site rounds, site visits of the facilities being managed by these agencies. You interact with the on-ground team to understand as to how they are managing, how things are getting worked out. And basis that, you then shortlist the agencies and then you go ahead and do the techno commercials, commercials, and then you finalize on one vendor. Now, once you have this FM agency on board, you have certain expectations basis which you hired an agency. First and foremost expectation is it's about money. Are you getting value for money? Is it leading to some kind of efficiency? Will it lead to any kind of optimization, maybe in terms of manpower, maybe in terms of consumption of materials? Apart from this, I expect as a client, OK, my process will be streamlined. I'll have pretty structured approach to managing my facility. I'll have specialists to manage my facility. Then comes the benchmarking. So when I look at a FM agency, FM service provider, for a FM service provider, they are providing services to maybe 10 different clients. They have access to data which is from 10 different companies. So I expect some kind of benchmarking to understand as to how I am performing. Where do I stand if I compare myself with my peers? Then I also think about knowledge sharing. Is there something new which is there in the industry? Is there a best practice which does not exist in my company as of now, which can be put in my company? And finally, what I expect is, OK, whatever is being planned, whatever is being worked out, is being built on a solid platform. So tomorrow, if I have to scale it up, that modularity has to be there. Now, when you have such a list of expectations, there are a lot of hurdles in achieving those expectations, which definitely becomes a challenge. First and the foremost challenge which I see is the sales team versus the operations team. What you are sold in terms of, OK, so if we are there, will provide you this, 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 their list of things. And once it works out, when you find the transition team on board, things are different. So the handover from sales team to operations team in terms of what we have promised and what needs to be delivered is something which is missing, can be better. Second part is, since we all know that this function has evolved over a period of time, and one major challenge that I see is maintaining the quality of manpower in this industry. What has happened is when this function started, this outsourcing agency started, so there was a lot of control on the quality of manpower being put in places. If you talk about facility managers, they used to be handpicked, maturity level was checked, and whether they are the right people in the right places or not. But what has happened over a period of time in the last, in the last 10, 15 years is that has got diluted magnitude has increased. So with the increase in magnitude, the quality of manpower, today everybody with an experience of seven, eight, or maybe 10 years, they want to become FM. And since there is a need in the industry for FMs, they are becoming FMs. So one point is to control the quality of manpower. That's another challenge. Link to this is 
we all know that for any function, there is a basic minimum qualification which is required. So somebody is looking for a person to work in finance team, we look at a basic uh, thing like this person should be an MBA from finance or maybe a CA. If you look at uh, sales, okay, this guy should be an MBA or a certain degree from certain institution. In case of FM, we don't look at any such qualification. We simply go by experience. So maybe as an industry, it can be worked out that we have some certification mechanism that, okay, if somebody as an FM is certified, he'll be given preference over the others. That's second part. Third challenge which I see is uh, the cash flow management, which is payment to the third party contractors. A lot of times it is seen that the payment to third party contractors doesn't happen at times and there are situations wherein it, uh, the agency has not been able to pay them and they just sort of go on a strike or they just walk off. So that is third part. Now moving from here, from challenges and coming to uh, disappointments, uh, I'll say one is uh, the advantages of economies of scale that a FM service provider has, the purchasing power that the uh, FM agency has does not get passed on really to a client. We don't see much of a value add in that area, that's one. Second is, in some cases, it is observed, seen, that FM agency becomes more of a, a manpower providing agency rather than being an agency which is managing your services taking care of things proactively. So these are the points which I want to talk about, challenges and disappointments. Very interesting. You, I'll come back to that because you made some very interesting points. And uh, before I go on to that, you know, let me get to Mr. Schroeder. Mr. Schroeder, given your international exposure and you would have seen the industry across the world, where do you think India is? Are we still at a very benign stage of evolution? Or you think that, you know, India is catching up fast to the practices that's being uh, adopted across the world? Is that an environmental issue or it's a, is it a mindset issue? Well, I'm living in India for about five years now. And uh, indeed, I have seen changes. And uh, if I come to the subject of this uh, panel discussion, I think that uh, India is still at a very low level. We are talking about a lot of new, in, uh, new techniques, uh, information technology, and so on. But if I look at the reality of our industry, and we supply cleaning equipment to FM companies, BSCs, and other clients, uh, there are two points I would like to point out which are quite different to international standards. The first one is that in the procurement process, uh, our clients don't care about quantities. And India is a large country with a poor infrastructure. So uh, deals are done at the last minute. The customer for, of the FM company is expecting that the job is starting, let's say, in five days or in seven days. And then the FM company is with internal pro procedures and three days before the contract starts, tell us you have to sell, uh, to supply in South India 50 machines of here, 30 and so on, which is impossible. So the industry is creating their own problems because they don't think about logistics supply chain and that is in other parts of the world much more understood and the reality is being considered. So first point. The second point which I think is even more severe is the after-sales service. Uh, just an example, if uh, a sweeper uh, is uh, in your custody and it's not working, you call the company, and that's not only for our company, that's throughout the industry. Service guy comes, maybe in 24 hours, he sends the quotations two days later, it takes between one and five weeks to make a decision that you want to go ahead for this uh, repair, you order the spare parts, the spare parts are being sent, the service guy comes, repairs the machine. So an unrealistic long time is being used for internal processes. In other parts of the world, there is a decision maker, an operational guy, the service guy comes, says, okay, you have to repair this and this, approximately cost would be like that. He said, yes, go ahead. He goes to a service van, takes out the part, repairs the machine, and on the same day the machine is working. 
We have tried this model here in India, but I haven't found a customer who is willing to change his processes and the procedures. So we and also other uh, companies in our industry are coming up with models which are also not really taken on. We offer rental because then it's our responsibility to make sure that, your that the machines are working uh, at your customer's client. But again, then people come, oh, it's too expensive. But people have to understand we are taking the risk. We are taking the risk to have spare parts available. We are taking the risk to do the service very fast. We have the financial risk. So uh, I think that in our industry, there are much better models how to, th to handle things. But the acceptance, and I don't have to say on your side, is hardly seen. And I think that is really my wish for us, for us as the industry, because it's bad for our uh, total reputation that customers of yours are saying, well, the machines are not working for a couple of days or a couple of weeks. But what is the reason? It's not that it's not possible. It's just the internal challenges which are there and which are not taken care. And we talk about all kind of new technologies, but these are some very simple, basic things which could be changed, I think, very fast. And our industry would be more sufficient. And also the cost would go down because, I mean, these procedures all take cost money, machine is not working, double visits, and so on and so on. So I think that is some of the inputs I want to give from an international perspective, what I have experienced and what I have seen in the Indian industry so far. Thank you, Edmund. That raises three thing, questions in my mind. Number one is, you know, we've seen of late, because of the growth of uh, individual orders on facility management, the decision making has slowly moved away from the administration department which used to make all these decisions into the procurement de department and into the CFO's office. So suddenly you find the CFO making decisions on who should be your service provider and supplier and not the people who actually have been managing those operations for a long time. And the trend typically has been the procurement guy comes in and says, is my job is to cut costs. And the getting this quality service out of the service providers is the admin's job, but I'm not here, my job is here to cut cost. This has been the experience of the industry in the recent past. So I have, quest first question is, both from the client's perspective and from a service provider's perspective, are you actually willing to pay more for a quality service? Is life cycle cost, as was discussed in the earlier panel, is really being considered? Or everyone is just down to saying, I'm going to give you a one-year contract. The procurement guy says, my KRA is based on how much of percentage I bring it down, and that's all that I'm concerned about. So I would like, uh, you know, I will to start about, because you've been at the receiving end of this probably. And then, you know, maybe Vikas and Naveen can respond whether the minds are opening up on the client end, which will also address what he is saying. I mean, you want service, you want someone to take on the total responsibility, you got to pay for the risk that service provider is taking. I think the decision making has moved from the CRE to the procurement and procurement is driving the cost down. Uh, what is also changing is the one year contracts moving into three year or five year contracts. And and when, as service providers, we are talking to clients, if cost be the determining factor, then we're looking at these long-term contracts so that if we have a guarantee, we can actually make investments into the contract. But also, if I were a part of that, dis that discussion, I would be able to talk better with my procurement peer or the person opposite me on the client side to really drive home the point of the imperative between the cost and the quality and how much cost cutting needs to be there and what is the minimum that one could look at which will still deliver that value and the quality. I'm glad to hear you're, at, you're saying that people are willing to look at a, a, a bit of a long-term contract, three or five years. How do the two of you look at it, uh, Mr. Rawat and Mr. Padhya? Are I, you still, are you comfortable giving a, let's say, a five-year contract to a service provider today? Uh, as we talked, uh, all our contracts are five years. We give that comfort to our service provider that, yes, you are here to stay. 
you are you don't have to bother about the contract only thing is you need to focus on the delivery so that is uh, one assurance that we give to our service partners right in the beginning uh, of course in case not performing slas are not met then uh, you have termination clauses so that is on one side where we go into long term agreements secondly uh, regarding the maintenance aspect even um, we recently purchased a lot of house cleaning equipment and we evaluated uh, both because this is a common uh, problem that machine is not working and what process he has explained is the same thing which goes and your machine is out of order for a good about week 10 days uh, we evaluated both rental model where entire responsibility is on the equipment provider and um, there is uh, turnaround time for any breakdowns and on the second side we looked at uh, where we are outright purchasing everything and thereafter we are putting comprehensive amc so that again turnaround time remains the same and based on that we have taken a call where we have taken a comprehensive amc where turnaround time is same so that uh, oem need not to bother about what spare part to be changed whether process need to, any cost need to be approved anything so that's how we are managing so that our downtime is barest minimum now when you want to take that uh yes uh things are moving towards long term contract and i'll go a step beyond this so when we do any project we are just not looking at uh, the project cost at that point of time that for a particular package let's say if it is uh, supply of uh, ups machines or hvac i look at my project cost project budget and close it we take a step ahead from there that okay apart from this when when i am closing my project package i'll have my 2 years of dlp or 3 years of dlp plus i look at total cost of operations if i give comprehensive amc to a vendor what will be my total cost of operations for 8 years which is 3 years of dlp plus 5 years of comprehensive amc so yes i'll agree that things are moving from short term contracts to long term commitments basis certain understanding and expectations that we have uh you mentioned another point this is that you have faced issues with the quality of manpower in a ifm situation on one end you have technology based services being delivered whether it is the the building management systems whether it is a water waste water management systems whether it is solid waste management and and your disaster management systems on the other end you have a whole lot of soft services which is purely driven by bodies how do you meet the challenge aval of dealing with technology based suppliers and vendors versus people who are pure body providers and how do you what is the procurement processes in both the cases and how do you manage that balance so today i think there is a mix of the two elements of one is the client is very focused only on cost and therefore you end up working with suppliers who are literally body shops and just providing you manpower and minimum wages with no experience with limited expertise on the other hand you come to a negotiating stand with a client where he's willing to pay you some money up front and then you look at your suppliers to provide you manpower with some experience uh but as we look and some of the technology aspects that i had spoken about earlier as we are moving in we are looking at robots coming in into the cleaning industry we are already looking at uh, more use of equipment um, less of manpower deployment really but i think the future is robotic cleaning and we've already seen trials and tests been happening in some of the parts of the world today um eventually the connected fm or the smart fm concept will link up with these robots will link up with the mainframe systems at the back which will integrate the entire uh, supplier systems into one large ecosystem and will deliver more efficiently with less manpower so are you then looking at developing strategic partnerships with your vendors and uh, body suppliers or do you go shopping on a contract to contract basis no so in the last couple of years that dynamics has also changed within supply chain and uh, we've started to form strategic alliances uh, not only with localized partners but partners that and offer solutions in multiple countries so from local you've actually gone global and that's a trend that a lot of the service providing companies have started to pick up in the last couple of years now i mean uh, coming from a 
client perspective, you know, you see today there are IPCs who are very large in, in FM services delivery and there are also non-IPCs who are also equally large. Do you think the IPCs come with an inherent advantage because they understand the building environment and the development environment or do you really don't see a difference between the two sets of service providers? I think uh, there is, is a difference uh, in terms of IPCs and non-IPCs and uh, what we expect as a client, my, my uh, own personal opinion will be yes, uh, IPCs uh, uh, they need to be, uh, they would be more specialized in what they do. So that's what I have. Mr. Schroeder, you know, taking on from what Mr. Seti was saying, maybe, you know, it says the client's not willing to make that investment if you want to get into a service delivery based renting of equipments. Looks like, you know, we will have to probably talk to large clients and large service providers to form those alliances. Would you agree with that? Definitely. I mean, I think that uh, our industry is quite large industry. And uh, the importance of our, our industry, I think, is not evaluated in the general public mind as it should be. Uh, I mean, just the cleaning part of the FM part is the biggest employer in the world and also in India. And uh, I think it's not realized neither by the government nor by the general public. So I think that we as an industry and that means suppliers, the service providers and so on, we have to work together to get the standards in our industry to a higher level and to also get a better understanding what we are providing. Because we talk about Clean India campaign, we talk about hygienic standards, but if companies and procurement departments and financial departments are not understanding that this costs more money than spending uh, the uh, what two dollars a day for for a cleaner, then we have an issue. So I really think that the industry has to work together with uh, more or less like a PR campaign, so people are understanding what we are contributing to society, and our uh, common offer to our clients is a big part of better hygienic standards, cleaningness, asset management, keeping values of assets, and this is really not understood. So clear, yes, we have to cooperate and make this much better understand to the general public. Taking cue from one of the statements, you said it's a huge employment potential, which is prop recognized or not properly recognized, and linking it with what Naveen said about the lack of quality of manpower or not having certified manpower. I would like to ask whoever wants to take it. It is now given this whole skilling mission that the country is talking about. And NSDC having a hospitality sector skills council will actually is supposed to certify right from a housekeeping attendant to a, a supervisor to a manager. Is there any move in the industry to, from a client perspective to say, that you would only deployed certified by NSDC operators in my premises. If I can take on, <clears throat> I think today it's at a very early stage because these concepts have just about started to begin. But what has already been in the market uh, in the last couple of years is get a different and a more varied pool into the manpower. So you're looking at diversity partners today. You're looking at people from other sections of the society, you're working with NGOs to bring in certain manpower and bring them into mainstream. So you have a very different pool and then you look at how do you develop the skill set today. So maybe what um, the Skill Development Council and all these people are doing, it'll probably take some time for the clients to start recognizing the value and really ask for those people. But in my view, I think those kind of people will also come at a cost. Uh, because now they will carry a certification and they will demand a value rather than what happens today is people get pushed on just minimum wages. Mr. Rawat, would you want to respond to that? Because if you want quality manpower, you would have to pay for it. Today what's happening is 
whether a guy is a 10 or 15 year old guy, experienced guy or a chap who joins today, both are placed at the minimum wages. And the client isn't willing to look at a cost structure which goes beyond minimum wages at the soft services level. Would the clients be open to pay for qualified, certified manpower? Uh, certainly, there is, uh, if you can, uh, by deploying more qualified, more efficient person, if you can cover more ground. So on one side, you can offer to pay him more salary. At the same time, you look on the other side, bringing in efficiency and reducing the number. So I look at if efficient manpower is coming, that is going to add value. And at the same time, it's not going to hit my budget. Because today, if I look at uh, especially housekeeping staff, uh, they are not 100% delivering. There is acute shortage of manpower. And uh, especially in campuses where you need to deploy manpower outside the building area, outside the conditioned area, they are more prone to uh, getting poached by other uh, companies. And that's where you'll find a constant churn. So if you are willing to pay a little more, bring efficiency, keep your budget in check, then it's absolutely uh, acceptable kind of a proposal. Navin, you want to add to that? So uh, to the point of whether I'll be willing to pay uh, extra for a certification, no, not simply because of certification. It has to come with certain efficiency, as uh, I would like to echo what uh, Vikas said, that it has to come with some value add. If today I'm deploying an unskilled labor who is, let's say, not certified and doing something in XRs, I expect somebody who is skilled, cert certified or something to do better than him. So somewhere that cost component will come. But having said this, yes, if it results into better quality, yes, it will be there. Hey, I will just add one more point because we were facing this challenge where we were having constant churn. And um, in campus, if some visitor is coming and he's asking some security guard for direction, and if this security guard is new to the campus, he doesn't know where this particular block is, where this particular company is, then it leaves little poor impression. So we wanted to retain this manpower which is deployed by a third party. So for that, we have taken a lot of initiatives so that we should be able to uh, make these po people poaching resistant. So we have uh, started giving them various facilities which more were from humanitarian grounds, but it were adding value to them. And at the same time, we have, from our pocket, we have added some cash incentive. And that has, uh, where we were used to have almost 30% manpower we used to churn every month, we now retain almost 95% manpower. Fantastic. So by doing this, because it's not only the amount, it's what value they bring in, what value they bring in to the perception of the users. So we give importance to that aspect as well. Mr. Schroeder, you have any views? Yes. Uh, I mean, I think in India we're getting, things, thankfully, away from the headcount principle to a delivering principle. And delivering means that we have to add value, and that means that we have to, have to have skilled laborers. Because if laborers don't know what they are doing, they are not producing hygiene standards, and they are not producing cleanness, and they are not effective. So what I see from a supplier of equipment, that there is a huge potential to increase the productivity and the delivery of good results. But that means people who are doing this job have to have a certain skill. So I think the FM industry has to make sure that in the National Skill Development Council, uh, the cleaning profession is getting an extra curriculum under FM heading and not under hospitality because the requirement of the FM industry is quite different from hospitality. So uh, we are supporting an initiative which is led by German VDMA. They are doing this skill training program for four years to work with the cleaning council. So the FM industry is getting recognized as an individual extra industry. And I think we are asking for the support of the members here uh, that we get this through because I think that is in all our interest. We need skilled people because that means in the future we need less people, but better educated people, they will get more money, but they will stay longer and they know what they are doing. 
Just one last uh, from a statement from my experience. In countries like Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and so on, cleaning profession is the vocational training uh, job which needs three years of education. So people are trained cleaners. They are getting good salaries, but they know what they are doing. And that means also that this profession then gets a much better recognition in our society, what I was saying before. If people can say, I'm skill, I have a skilled certificate, and it's uh, uh, recognized by the government. So I think that should be in all our interest, and I urge you to support this initiative uh, because I think that would be good for the industry, for our industry. Good point. I think that the industry should take it up. Before I throw it open to the question, I have one last question to Owen. With this increasing demand on the service standards and the competing pressure on costs, consolidation of services within a partnership in a large campus is probably easy. Have you attempted consolidating services in a neighborhood with different buildings, different ownership, and tried to talk to them saying, there will be economy of scale that could be built in by you guys putting your faith in a single service provider, which I know you have done on the transportation front. Has it worked on the other building services front where you could convince people or each client wants to have his own favorite boy delivering services? So we've, we've definitely tried out these models and what we've tried out are central teams located in locations like the cyber city in Gurgaon, for example, a centralized team which gets into offices, cleans and comes out without physical manpower being there. We've tried concepts like these in the Manyata Tech Park in Bangalore, for example, which is again a campus location. But at the end of it, we realized that there are a lot of complications um, and the clients are not, were not happy at that point in time with this whole concept and we had to revert back to individual deployments. We had proposed many models to the clients, some even that when we propose manpower, we build in relievers, we build in um, other people into it, and we could have those as pooled resources within that campus location. If you have absenteeism or attrition somewhere, these pooled resources could be plugged in in those locations. Deep cleanings could be all centralized, but somehow probably it's too new to the clients, it'll probably take a while for acceptance to come in. But I think that's the future, and uh, that is where we should be headed. Good. I think I'll now throw it open to the question. Please identify yourself, and, uh, and if you want to address it to a particular panelist, please feel free. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, this is Sandeep Kadam here. I'm a director with Logicon Facility Management Private Limited, based out of a Pune. A company here provides services across the India. My very uh, simple and layman questions to all the panelists is, is an SLA model what we talked about, is it workable? And if it is workable, or if it is not workable, is it been only used as a penalty to the vendors? That is the first question. The second question, is the industry ready with an S purely SLA model or probably a cost per square feet model. Com considering the uh, you know, variable compliance requirements exist in our country, and at the same time, keeping quality in the mind. Okay, uh, regarding the first question, whether SLA-driven contracts, it's uh, a tool to penalize the service provider, so to say. Uh, one, when we are agreeing for SLAs, we should focus on those SLA should be clearly measurables. If they are subjective, then there may be difference of opinion. But if they are purely uh, quantitative, where you can define everything, suppose uh, we say that there will be no OT, or if OT will be just 2%. So in that scenario, it's very simple that between service provider and client, it's a very clear thing what percentage of OT you have done. So it is no discussion, it's very clear. Secondly, wherever it's uh, subjective in nature, that's where service provider sometimes feels that he is unnecessarily being pushed. It's like quality of service. 
quality of cleanliness that you have provided or quality of maintenance that you have done on a particular equipment. So that's where defining the SLA is most, most critical thing while you are going for a SLA driven contract. So that was uh, for the first part in, in case I have addressed your query. Point comes that if it's a manpower based contract, then there are certain uh, labor compliances and other compliances for which uh, principal employer is ultimately responsible. So your uh, per square foot model, we have not evaluated, so I'll not be able to comment much on that. But as a principal employer, I'll look at whether I am covered fully from all compliances of, or not. If, if a service provider is cutting down the cost or offering me a lower uh, per square foot maintenance cost, it looks tempting, but if I find that certain compliances have been left open, which ultimately will land on me, then probably I'll think twice. I think Mr. Sethi might confirm, it actually happens in the industry. Per square foot contracts, ensuring compliance has been worked out. So yes, those models are, uh, are in place, but uh, the, the industry is still not so matured. So you have some clients who are moving that path, but there are many clients who don't want to take that. And the answer is actually in your question itself because the labor compliances today and the whole system is so complicated today that how do you actually justify um, the number of people deployed and the compliances related to them to do that SLA-based contract? So. On an SLA, while you contract for just a cleaning service, you still need a certain number of people. The service provider may say, I can do a job with five people versus 10 people today, but you may have only four people tomorrow or maybe seven people day after. How do you monitor and measure those? And how do you actually go back to your labor department uh, to qualify is, is a conflict today. Uh, but I think in the last couple of years, we've seen a trend where clients have started picking up the discussion around SLA-based contracts. Uh, we've seen that dramatic change happening in the industry. Uh, and this is more so because of all the MNCs that have set up uh, uh, here. And they've been used to SLA-based contract in the other countries, and they would want that consistency. They would want the same methodology. Um, and therefore, they're talking more and more about the SLA-based contracts. You had a question. I'm Bupesh Patak from Kushman and Wakefield. Uh, I would like to compliment Mangla ma'am for having uh, selected the three topics for today. They are all interlinked with each other. And I would like to uh, compliment the eminent panelists over here for having brought out the aspects of both the, the first uh, panel also, as well as the coming in uh, panel discussion effectively in their during the discussion. That is, uh, you linked it to the technology, how you would like to exploit technology in terms of you know delivering procurement, as well as uh, there was an element of uh, you know, uh, discussion which will go roll on into the uh, need for an FM regulator when you talk about depletion of a certain quality and how to you know protect it at the at the you know the cost not getting uh, at the at the uh, cost not getting uh, uh, below a certain levels. So uh, that is a comment I wanted to make that uh, you you know touch both the topics also. Also, uh, when you're talking about the subject of uh, uh, the, the major thing, the observation that I had. We have uh, two supply chain heads, one from the service provider's end uh, sitting with us here, and one from the you know, uh, client's end. So uh, when we talk about the exploitation of supply chain and acting as a catalyst uh, towards uh, facilities management, if you see it from a perspective of the service provider, how the supply chain management within the service provider's organization could benefit and act as a catalyst towards the, the FM business, so that is by bringing in the cost efficiencies, taking on the risk which is there, and not at the cost of quality. So these are the three basic aspects where we come that it can act as a catalyst in enhancing the business and act as a business enhancer. Now, once that is done and the cost efficiencies are already in place, that is a time uh, there is a need to outsource more and more services. We are talking more about uh, labor, manpower provide, provisioning, we also should touch about you know the material supply which is there in terms of procurement the various type of you know uh, consumables and uh, various you know equipment which is there the efficiencies that the supply chain can bring to the fm business in those uh, procurement avenues also so once that is done 
more and more of uh, this type of pro uh, procurement also gets outsourced towards uh, the FM service provider. So in turn, what may lead into is the service provider supply chain taking on more and more responsibilities of the serv uh, client's service, uh, service supply chain management team, the procurement team, and taking on their functions. Do you think there is a, this will lead to more, this uh, FM outsourcing will lead more and more towards supply chain outsourcing also? And if so, do you think it makes sense to outsource more and more of supply chain function to the facility management companies? This is just a question to you have any, you want any particular panelist? No, anyone can take on. I just observed that you have service providers as well as. Okay. <coughs> so, if we talk about outsourcing uh, supply chain management, uh, I'll say as of now, uh, it's not a mature stage wherein we can talk about or it is immediately going to happen. But yes, as FM outsourcing itself is consolidating and once that confidence is there, this may lead to uh, outsourcing of SCM at a date when things are ready and we are there. Anyone else? So from our perspective, I think, again, <coughs> we've seen this shift in the last one year. A lot of companies are coming to us to take on their entire material supply, for example, their entire good services and material supplies. Um, as we're talking to other clients, a lot of clients are actually interested because today the whole procurement life cycle has become very complex for them. Right from raising a PR within the internal system to their procurement departments, aligning to the requester, uh, going out with RFPs, RFQs to suppliers seeking quotation, the whole contract cycle, onboarding the suppliers, which could be multiple suppliers for multiple sites across cities and end up with hundreds of suppliers on board for material supply to invoice validation at sites, to the whole invoice processing and the payouts. It's a very large complex operation. It involves a lot of people actually deployed on the client side, which today the client is, or the client feels that they would be better off if they were to outsource all this into and consolidate with one service provider um, and therefore create efficiencies within their whole system. They, those positions could either become redundant and therefore it leads to cost efficiencies or they could redeploy their own people into more strategic initiatives or into a lot of their core activities. So that is a trend that we've seen uh, happening in the last one year. Any further questions? Yeah, my name is Rahul. I uh, head the operations for Crystal Group of Companies. We have approximately 30,000 people across uh, nation and we have more than 650 clients. Now, I would like to seek a guidance from the panelists. Uh, how about the credit lines? For example, I am awarded with a contract. Uh, a contract is based on the labor or the SLAs. I am being asked to give a credit line of 30 days or 60 days maximum. Wherein, on the other side of the table, I am being... Um, the government authorities, that is service tax, I have to pay my service tax on 5th. My compliances, if I am not supporting the compliances on time, I am being penalized by the government. If I do not uh, submit my supportings to my client, my client will not pay me my money. So how would you guide a, a service partner in this particular challenge? Where cash flow, where Mr. Naveen was talking about the cash flow, how this cash flow, how you would guide us in improving the cash flow and making the salaries and the payments on time? Well, I think uh, in this case, uh, so far as cash flow is concerned, uh, most of the times observation has been that it is on account of errors which are there in the invoice and back and forth of the invoice which happens between the FM service provider and the client because of which you will find this delay to be there. As a solution, as of now, what I see is doing things the right the first time. So when you are raising a bill, it needs to be thoroughly checked, due diligence needs to be done and then put up and then maybe if this is such a pressure point, it can also be discussed with the client and 
if it is agreed a certain turnaround time or a time frame within which this payment can be done, then it can be worked out. I think training is an inherent part of in this business. Wherever the people are involved and there are services provided through manual labor, training has to be an inherent part of it. Whether certification happens or not is secondary. So, as uh, Mr. Schroeder suggested, I, we as an industry should work towards creating a separate sector uh, skill council under NSDC if that is the way out. We need to find a way of cert uh, certifying and getting that recognition into it. And you heard two panelists representing the client saying, if you give me quality manpower that shows efficiency, they are willing to pay for it. So I think the industry has to make that move. Thank you. Uh, I think I will, in the interest of uh, closing this session, we, I think we had a very interesting session. It's obvious that the industry is still evolving. It's not completely mature yet. But the, the good aspect is there is a recognition both from a service provider's perspective and from a client perspective that there has to be a move more towards quality and less towards pushing the cost down. There is a move and an understanding that long-term contracts are important for the service providers to invest in technology, invest in equipments, and therefore provide greater service, which wasn't happening in the past, which is again a good sign. And a similar res response from the client saying they would be willing to support that. So let's hope that five years from now, when we meet again, we will talk about the efficiency of, of those systems rather than talk about whether do we need those systems or not. Having said that, thank you all. I think for a patient hearing, as Sajid said earlier, I didn't see anybody walk out, so it looks like a very involved audience here. Thank you. A very, very uh, wonderful session indeed, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, now I'd like to invite Mr. Sajid Shankar, uh, Managing Director of Integrated Facilities Management and Asset Services at uh, Cushman Wakefield, India, to please come on stage and present the mementos. Firstly, to our fabulous session moderator, Mr. S. Narayan. Let's have a huge round of applause. <laughs> to Mr. Abal Sethi. to Mr. Vikas Rabat, to Mr. Rudiger Schroeder, and to Mr. Naveen Upadhyay. I also request Mr. Sajid to please join our panel members for a group photograph and let's have a huge round of applause there one more time for our fabulous panel members. <laughs>